This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. Can you imagine taking a little lamb out of the field and now it's been in your house for four days? You know how what, what make, makes it want to play and where it's like its ears rubbed and everything else because you're rubbing it and examining to make sure that everything is just perfect and you're loving on it. And then comes the Passover day where that lamb has got to die. And they did it year after year after a year, not realizing it was a prophetic glimpse of that which is to come. And really, the Jewish people understand this. I, I've got a friend that uh, his family are, uh, are in the Sanhedrin, they're in the, the, the Knesset, and he was being raised to become a, another rabbi. And if you ever get a chance to hear Zev Peratz testimony. He was, God, I mean, God had him like this and was just convicting the snot out of him. But, you know, no, 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 I know, I know what the rabbis teach. I know this, and there's this blinder up. Let me tell you something. When the blinder came off, it's because the, the glory of God appeared over his bed as he was wrestling with this and said, I am Jesus, and I am Almighty God, and I am Messiah. I tell you what, when you have a glory cloud appeared over your bed, God starts talking to you, all of a sudden, yes, sir. And he has a wonderful ministry over there leading the Jewish people to Jesus, their Messiah. And he, he, at this last conference, he showed a film, and all he was talking about was Passover. It didn't touch on Jesus. He was talking about the wonders of what Moses had done and the lessons that we draw from the Passover lamb. And the moment he got that redemption comes through the shed blood, the secular Jewish man says, you're talking about Jesus, and I don't want anything to do with it. We need to pray for Israel to return back to Moses. When they return to Moses, the veil will be lifted and they'll see Jesus for who he is. How many know God's got their number? Come on. We jump forward now to John chapter 1 and verse 29. There was a supernatural birth, a virgin conceived. And some of the rabbis, when they look back at the prophecies, they say, well, when, when Isaiah said a virgin shall conceive, that Alma simply means a virtuous wound. But what they won't tell you is that when Isaiah penned it for, for the mem in Alma, he put a mem sofit, which only goes at the end of a word, no place else, but yet he puts it in the middle of the word because the mem sofit means closed womb so that there could be no misinterpretation. Now, they won't tell you that, but yet it's there in a properly written scroll of the Navaim that Mem Sophit to this day is still yelling, a virgin shall conceive. And it caused a lot of hubbub. Sometime before Jesus was born, his cousin John the Baptist was born, 
And so there was a lot of hubbub with his conception and all these things. And, and there was great debate. You know, Jesus is just going quietly over here and everybody's concentrated on John the Baptist, so much so that the Pharisees and religious leaders were, decided they were going to get rid of John the Baptist. And so they confronted Zechariah between the porch of the altar and he wouldn't give up his family and they killed him over it. And so John the Baptist was raised among the Essenes out of the reach of the religious leaders. But what few people know is that the Essenes ended up being the keepers of the mantle of Elijah. So when John the Baptist came preaching, he was literally wearing the mantle of Elijah when he came. Oh, that just makes goosebumps go up and, up and down my arms when you think about that. The exactness of what God does. And so John is ministering he is, he is doing a mikvah, and John the Baptist did not invent baptism, Moses did. Mikvah was a common practice among Judaism. In fact, when you, when you look back at the Temple Mount and how it was laid out, there were over a thousand baptismal pools because a male, when he would come up, he would self-mikvah, he would wash himself before going into the temple of God, a part of preparing, because now I'm going to walk with God. But I think it's interesting that when Moses told them to, he told them to wash for three days. Messiah's knocking. Three days, not four days, not two days. Because they had to wash the stench of Egypt off of them before they appeared before God. Oh, boy, I could go in about nine different directions right now. You see, something happens when you go down under the water. That's a declaration to all of hell. You're leaving it behind. You want to wash off even the smell of hell off of you when you come up, and now you're only going to walk in the kingdom of God. And so here John is ministering, and Jesus comes up to be baptized. Now look at what Jesus said. He didn't say, hey, cuz, how's it going, man? I'm glad you're supporting my ministry. We're about ready to get on satellite television. He didn't say that, did he? Jesus said that the greatest prophet that ever lived wasn't Elijah. It was John the Baptist. John the Baptist took the Elijah anointing up a whole nother notch. Whew. And he sees his cousin Jesus. And all of a sudden he declares, Behold! the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now in Hebrew, in Jesus' name is Yeshua. Salvation took legs and walked among us. He said, look that man there whose name is salvation is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we got a testimony by a prophet. At the end of Jesus' life, we know about the triumphal entry and the commotion that went with that, the Hosanna, and how it made the high priest mad because he was coming in one direction, Jesus was coming in another, and all the accolades that were supposed to be his because he had just went down to Bethlehem to pick the lamb for all of Israel. The Lamb of God is coming, and everybody's recognizing Him. And He says, you need to tell these people to shut up. And Jesus says, if they don't cry out, these rocks will cry out. Now, what the sages of Israel will, will mention, if you go back, and, and there, there was a problem with when Antiochus Epiphanes, when he desecrated the altar of God. That there is no, uh, there is there is nothing in Scripture on how to cleanse and rededicate a, a a desecrated altar. And so, what's recorded in in the annals of of, of Israel is the rabbi said, "We're just going to have to wait for Messiah to come." A Messiah interprets all things. When he comes, he will figure it out. So they broke it up and they took it outside the city and they left it in a big pile. 
Many scholars believe when Jesus said, these rocks will cry out, he pointed to the desecrated altar that had pig's blood all over it that I think represented the Gentiles because a Gentile had done it. If the Jewish people don't cry out, the Gentiles will. Selah. Think about that for a little bit. Interesting. But I want to go to John chapter 11 and 45. It was the high priest's duty. We, we need to understand that when, that when the Catholic Church historically has used the Passion Week to foment this hatred for the Jewish people. That is so unbiblical. The high priest had to choose the one that was going to, the lamb that was going to die for all of Israel. The high priest had to officiate over that lamb being slain. Only the priesthood and the Jewish people could offer up the sacrifice because it was the duty of the children of Abraham to do it. No pagan could do it. We forget in Isaiah, it says that it pleased the Father. How hard that must have been. But yet he knew the outcome. They are not the God slayers. They are the sometimes even unwilling participants of God's plan. Do you know that God is even using the Talmudic Kabbalah rabbis, and that doesn't represent all the rabbis and all the Jewish people, but he's even using them for the unfolding of prophecy because they will have to recognize and empower the son of perdition before the eyes of Israel is open and everybody gets saved. They thought, man, these guys that led us down and got us to abandon Moses and, and has said all these bad things about Jesus, and all of a sudden, when they see the absolute fruit of what they have done, Paul says in that one moment, all of Israel will be saved. So they have their plan to, to, to fulfill, and, they're not, and Almighty God did not get shocked and surprised that a rabbinical movement started or that the Talmud and the Kabbalah were written because when they rejected Messiah, they left the kingdom and they ended up going back under the authority of principalities and powers and they began drawing from the mystery religions. And they're going to find out, like Solomon said, all of that is vanity. Every bit of it. And so as we watch this play out, tell yourself, God's got it under control. He's got it under control, and he has a remnant in Israel. There are many rabbis that have rejected Talmud, and they say, you know what? I think I'll stick with Moses. Oh. But listen here in verse 47. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do for this man works many signs? If we let him alone... Uh, like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place, our place, our place, our place, and our nation. They were more worried about their place than their nation. Talmudic writings are to establish the place of the rabbis over Moses and over everybody else. The birthplace of it, I think, was right here. Now, I'm not Jewish bashing. How many know I stomp on the church pretty hard? You see, no matter if you're Jew or Gentile, if you're Jew or Christian, we all need Jesus. We all need to repent because we all got it wrong somewhere. Okay? Listen, and, and one of them said, Caiaphas being high priest that year. So this is what the high priest is saying. Here's what I'm going to do. You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he said, did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not, only, not for the nation only, but he also would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad." What the high priest did, there was a guy that was born in Bethlehem, 
because of the census we find at the beginning of the Gospels, which was most likely during the fall feasts, a Savior was born named Yeshua that was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And now the high priest, even though a few days before he had chosen a lamb that would die for all of Israel that got no fanfare, but he got mad at the lamb who was born in Bethlehem that came in on a donkey that, was, that people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us. Not recognizing what was going on, he just chose that lamb to be slain for Israel. You got to follow the lamb to understand what God is doing. Come on. Not the lamb that man chooses, but the lamb that God chooses. He chose the lamb. Pontius Pilate in John 18 and 19. Three times. You see that? There's this four days, this, this Passion Week of Christ. They, they had to examine the lamb. Nobody could find fault with him. They had to create a kangaroo court. They had to pay people to lie because nobody could find fault with him. Now they bring it to Pontius Pilate. In verse 1838, And when Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. He's a lamb without blemish. 19, 1 and 4. So Pontius took Jesus and scourged him, and the, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him the purple robe, and, he said to, and they said, Hail, G, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Then Pontius went out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Man! But wait, there's more. We're not done yet. Verses 5 and 6, And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple... Whoop, I got to turn. Nope. Verses 5 and 6, And Jesus came out wearing the thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate, this, this is Pilate's last order, he said, You take him and you crucify him, because I find no fault in him. Thoroughly examined. No spot, no wrinkle. Jesus wasn't cross-eyed. He didn't. They could, they could find no moral reason. They could find no physical reason. But they feared for their own positions of power. Now, isn't it interesting that a few years later in 70 AD, the zealots took over the high priest. And what they did caused the cascading events that Jerusalem was destroyed. All for the simple reason that they refused to give up a daily offering simply, simply for the health of Caesar, that he would live a long life. And during the siege, that the, the, the Roman army said, if you want to leave Jerusalem, you can. Before we, before we execute our judgment, those that want to leave that weren't a part of this, you can. Those zealots went through their own streets and killed their own people. Even the Romans were horrified at the violence. But yet they offered up Jesus because they were afraid of losing their position. How many times, I wonder, do we repeat that in our life that we don't really follow God the way we should because we're afraid we're going to lose our position or our wealth or something else? Jumping on to John 19, 14, and 22. And it was the preparation day of the Passover. Underline that in your Bible. That's when all the lambs were being slaughtered. The preparation day. You have to slaughter them and you have to roast them. And it was about the six hours. And they said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Pilate 
as an official of Rome, just declared that Jesus was their king. So let it be written, so let it be done, okay? He declared it, it wasn't a mockery. And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And then he delivered him to them to be crucified, so that they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to the place uh, called the, the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on one side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, one of the things that Moses had taught them was to always look for a sign, and one of the ways they looked for a sign in writing were acrostics. Okay? And many of the Jews read the title that was placed where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And, and therefore the chief priest to, uh, of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have written what I have written. Do you know why? When you take that in Hebrew and you write Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, in the acrostic it literally reads yod He vav He. That the God with the nailed hand was present. And he was being revealed in that moment. Jesus became our sacrifice, guys, in the exact same place that Abraham built an altar to offer up Isaac. You want to talk about the exactness of God. We underestimate the God of covenant. What, what Abraham did, he created a doorway for God to bring salvation. That that place became the doorway to planet earth for the salvation plan of God. And when Jesus was risen up on the cross, it became the doorpost of the door to the earth. And God put the blood of the Lamb over the doorpost for our redemption. Yeah, I am going to get it. It's not in my notes. Some say that the blood of Jesus was poured out on the ground. I don't think a drop ever hit the ground. Because when you look at biblical sacrifice, an unworthy animal that wasn't worthy of a sacrifice, you poured the blood on the ground. The book of Hebrews says that when he rose from the dead, he carried his blood with him because he laid it on the mercy seat of God. And to this day, that blood is speaking. And it speaks better things than that of Abel. That was on a Wednesday. That year, and I've actually got a letter from the Naval Observatory that confirmed that year that that Passover, because Passover is a high Sabbath, so there were two Sabbaths that week. That Jesus died on Wednesday, and he actually did fulfill exactly what he promised, the sign of Jonah. He was in the belly of the earth three full days. He resurrected. Now, biblically, a day begins at sunset, not sunrise. So sometime after sunset, but well before sunrise, the tomb was emptied. I always had a problem with sunrise services. Because the Bible says, yet while it was dark, the tomb be empty. Okay, that's the Ozarkian way of saying it. Now we pick up again in Matthew 28, 1 through 8. Now after the Sabbath, so the second Sabbath, which would have been Friday night to Saturday night, okay? When the sun went down, Sabbath was over, and you could begin doing a lot of things. You could travel, and you could do whatever you wanted to do. And that's when the first day of the week began. 
And after the Sabbath, after the first day of the week began, Mary Magdalene and others came to the see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled back the door, the stone from the door that sat on it. His countenance was as lightning and his clothes was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. You know, when God shows up, even the biggest, baddest, and bravest the world has to do just kind of rolls over. They fell as dead men. They weren't going to stop Jesus from resurrecting. But the angel said unto the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He's not here. Our Savior has an empty grave. He's not here. They can't come up with his body. He's not here, for he is risen as he said. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Now we're going to, in our next session, get into continuing to follow the Lamb. But if you don't deal with the Lamb here, you don't get to the rest of it. The watchword of this hour is, what will you do with the Lamb of God? Will you accept his sacrifice? Will you surrender to him? Will you accept the sacrifice that all of our sins were, were carried by him on the cross? And that only through his shed blood do we have redemption. You cannot be good enough. For all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Only Jesus, only his sacrifice. And to receive it like Abram, I've got to hear him call my name, and I've got to walk out of Babylon to receive it. So there's a leaving off before there's a putting on. I've got to put off the old man so I can put on the new. And what we're remembering on Passover when we, when we do the Lord's table, we're remembering the sacrifice that he made, and that it's not our own righteousness that saves us but it's the righteousness that can only be obtained through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lamb of God. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.